Hi, welcome to TonkoCast. This is Daisu Tsutsumi, and today I'm really excited that you get to hear Robert Kondo's interview、um, with Eriko Anson Lee and Maureen Fan from Baobab Studios about their latest animated short film, Namu. Maureen Fan is someone we worked very closely with at Pixar, and also she helped us on the Dam Keeper. Short film. She's the CEO and co founder of the Baobab Studios, and she's the producer of Namu. Our next guest is Eun San Lee, who is an incredible artist. He recently moved to the San Francisco Bay Area to join the Pixar art department. But my favorite thing Eun San has done is his own short film, My Moon, he directed.、Um, It is one of my favorite shots of all time. He's an incredibly talented storyteller. And our final guest is Eric O. He's my dear friend.、Um, and some of you may know that he's worked at Tonko House for a long time. He was the supervising animator for the Dam Keeper short, and he directed the Dam Keeper Poems the series. And most recently, he was my right hand person.、Um, Serving as the episodic director on Tonkas' latest project, Oni. Of course, he was nominated、uh, for an Oscar,、uh, Best Animated Short Film category, last year with his short film,、uh, Opera. And I can't believe how quickly he has his next project lined up. So before I turn it to Robert, Let's take a look at the Namu trailer together and then their discussion will follow. Baobab, thank you guys. You know, Eric, Alsung, and Maureen, thank you for being here.、Uh, just to kick things off, Maureen, do you want to give us a tell us a little bit about the story、uh, about Namu? Sure. Thank you so much for having us. We are super honored. <laughs> okay, so Namu, which means tree in Korean, is directed by Eric O,、oh, who's on our podcast with us today.、Um, it's a story of one man from his birth to his death and each stage of his life. Childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and later years is represented by a tree as it grows alongside him from spring, summer, fall, and then winter. So instead of having leaves on this tree, they're objects that represent this man's life in the tree. And it's about figuring out what is meaningful in this man's life. Awesome. That's huge. I mean, Eric, you know. You and I have worked together in the past telling stories、um, for Tonko House and、um, you know, back at Pixar, even.、Uh, we worked on The Dam Keeper together. I know that every time you tell stories, and this one sounds like a big one, I mean, it's covering the entirety of life in many ways,、um, that they all sort of come from a place that are a deep attachment to you, to your personal life.、Um, for what you're comfortable with, can you share some of the personal aspects of your life that inspired Namu? Of course.、Um, yeah, as Mary said, thank you so much for having us. And then, yes, Tonko, it's my second home almost. <laughs> so, always nice to always be- welcome back, Eric. Yeah. So,、um, yeah, Namu means tree in Korean.、Um, so, basically, the core idea of Namu was there already、uh, for 
10 years almost. Um, but my grandfather actually passed away almost 10 years ago. That was my first time experiencing uh, um, saying goodbye to someone who's very close to you. And it, every one of us experienced that. And then, but because it was my first time, you know, it got me thinking a lot about life, you know, um, because it was actually, unfortunately, kind of sudden goodbye. So we weren't very prepared, you know. So this, during this grieving process, I made myself a little doodle, almost like a picture book kind of doodle and scribbles about this man um, um, hanging his memories and belongings, you know, on a tree to grow the tree. So that was really it. That was it. And never shared it with anybody at the time and put it deep in my mental drawer and then and then let it settle and moved on. Because again, I was definitely um, too overwhelmed to um, emotionally overwhelmed to take it out and share it with the world. So I moved on. You know, um, I went to Pixar and working on so many, so many amazing movies. That's where, where I met you guys also. And then and worked on other films like The Dam Keeper or Opera, all those things, life moved on. But really um, sometime uh, almost two years ago, I had this inner curling that maybe it's time for me to share this um, and, and, you know, take it out to my mental drawer. And that's when I met this amazing people from Baobab, Marine and Kane and, and people over there who are so happy to support me to, you know, um, give birth to this project. So that's the, that's Namu. That's how Namu came to the world. That's amazing. I mean, and thanks for Eric for sharing. That's, you know, th that sounds like a hard thing. Um, it is exciting that I didn't realize that actually Namu, the origin of Namu is even before when oh, back you were at Pixar. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. And then, you know, you and Maureen and Baobab kind of coming together is exciting. I mean, for myself and Dice and everyone at Tonko House, that's exciting because obviously we love both groups and um, really excited to see that come together. Maureen, for you, what was it that, how did Eric come to be at Baobab? What was it that, that you were excited about in terms of bringing Eric to Baobab? I admired Eric oh, ever since I was working with you guys on the Dam Keeper. It was a party. I don't remember where it was. I just remember there's like, green astroturf grass on the ground and we were sitting at this big picnic table and I sat next to Eric O and I just thought I started talking to him like trying to convince him at that point somehow for me to be able to work with him somehow but I don't even know I didn't even have like a job in animation at the time but I knew I really wanted to work with him but after watching the Dam Keeper poems I I was just so blown away by Dam Keeper poems I was telling all my friends you have to watch this I was crying I just thought it was so magnificent and then Eric Dar Darnell, my co-founder, had seen it too, and we were just geeking out about it for a really long time. So we were fans of Erico, and he knows um, Kane well. And so I think he had shared the story of Namu with Kane, and Kane wanted um, us to hear it. And so he came in and shared it, and we were already fans. And at the end, um, David Kahn, who's our business guy, was crying <laughs> he never he never cries so he doesn't cry publicly and so just like all of us were super emotional and we just really loved the vision and so it's something that we wanted to make happen um so we were just drawn that's to awesome. it and so that that's how we met and got together we just needed to find a way to make it no matter what because we just fell in love with the vision and we loved ergo that's that's amazing. You talked about Kane. Kane is someone, you know, he's the producer, if I'm correct, on Namu. Um, also, your head of content at Baobab. Uh, Eric, Asang, Kane. Uh, also, your executive producer, John Cho, are all of Korean origin or Korean American. Um, I noticed throughout Namu, Korean elements, uh, just like Eric, your, you know, previous short opera, um, it has Korean elements throughout. Uh, can both Eric and Asan, can you guys tell me a little bit about the Korean influences in Namu? Um, yeah, I can, I can share first. Um, first of all, one mini fun fact um, that's also related to Korea, just as Maureen said, it is true that I pitched this story to Kane first. And that was in Korea too. And oh, that wow. was when we had a Tonkao's exhibition in Seoul, Korea. <laughs> it was really that. We were all down Got there it. together. And Robert, you were there. Dice were there. And Kane happened to be there too. And we were had really just half an hour coffee, literally. And then it's when, hey, Kane, I have a this story that could potentially, you know, utilizing this sort of high-end VR technology. 
And then that's how I actually, but, you know, we weren't talking about anything about, you know, technology at all, but the story. And then that was a real seed of everything, you know, <laughs> that became this um, project. Um, speaking of Korea, um, first of all, of course, um, because this is coming from such a deep personal place, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, drawing and, and pulling all the ideas from my personal anecdote and for old memories. So I think it, it was so natural for me to, you know, um, apply some of the Korean elements, you know, it wasn't intentional at all. Like we weren't going to, okay, this is going to celebrate, you know, some part of Korea or anything like that. It's, it was just about life. And, and you know, because again, you know, um, coming from my own memories and everything, you know, because I grew up in Korea, it was so natural to have a lot of Korean influences in the film as well, you know? So that's like some of the things. And then awesome. Do you have any, you know, additional thoughts there as a Korean American as well? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, firstly, like, it, I think, I think as the film kind of like kept growing into find like some find details that will make the character more believable in many ways, I think having the Korean element really helped, especially when you're looking at this film as a like a life, life of a person and looking at a kind of a um, like a, there is a certain like a perspective to it, you know, like it's not going in too deep, but we know every events and growth of this character and having some of these Korean elements that we can relate to that, that I remember from a childhood or, or or traditional items that I feel like is, oh yeah, like I know what it's like to be in that age with those items. And I think that maybe that, that helped me to understand the storylines a little bit more. Um, and especially as a Korean American, you know, like, my whole time in being in LA, like I had, it was, there was not been, there has not been that many like films or shows that has an Asian representative, like um, that I was like a, a part of, I think uh, only one at, from Netflix, but in this one specifically was Korean um, influences, which I was really happy to work on. So all in all, like personally and creatively, I think having that Korean influence just made made my experience with the film like a much more like engaging, I think is the better way to say it for sure. Is there anything because the short, what's amazing about the short is that in a short amount of time, you really do go from birth through this entire life lived. And you really feel in such a short amount of time that you get to see, it's, there's almost a voyeuristic quality that you get to see these deeply personal moments of a character, who is in those spaces, you've almost picked these points in this, this character's life um, that are major milestones within their life, significant moments, but they're not all like kind of these big moments. They're, a lot of them are quiet moments, these little, little moments that feel really intimate and do feel really personal. Are there things in this that you can share with us that are like very uniquely from your life or from your grandfather's life, Eric, or, you know, Al Song, you talk about these cultural touch points. Like, what are those things that we can see that maybe the audience may not know? I have a feeling, much like myself, will sort of sense, but is there anything in there that you really feel like that's that's a little bit of me in, in Namu? Eric, do you wanna go yeah, sure. um, about it? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So Namu is basically, you know, even though the core inspiration was coming from, you know, um, my experience with gran my grandfather, but the, the film is not necessarily about my grandfather. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's about life and, and I'm, you know, pulling ideas and it's more a combination of what I learned and what I experienced and, and you know, from my family or someone who, who I love, you know. That being said, um, there are a little bit of everything here and there, but like to, you know, you know point to your question, you know, I think the aspect of the person loving the art and painting, the life as a painter, that itself already is directly coming from my own outlook on life, you know. So, but at the end of the day, art and painting here, you know, even though it is portrayed as a life of a painter, but art and painting here in this film, you know, represent what you love. You know, it doesn't have to be art, you know, it can be something that makes you who you are. So um, even though, again, it is very personal piece, but I hope this is universal enough for everybody to find their own, you know, story and themselves in the story, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 
um, just to add on like what Eric was saying too, and kind of piggybacking on what Robert, you mentioned that, yeah, this film kind of has that like voyage kind of uh, uh, like a way of telling story. And I, I think that's actually what like what I really liked about it. You know, it's not so much about like, oh, this happened and that happened and plots pile up and there's a, you know, big uh, turning point. Like there, it's not about, that's not like necessarily how we experience life, you know? And there are a lot of like a mundane moments. I think that like was really, for me is what shaped a certain period of time. And there is a one moment, um, the character is a, a little bit older and like kind of forgot about his passion and working at like, you know, company job, like doing paperwork and all. And then at night, like he eats like ramen and kimchi <laughs> like by himself on a, on the ground too, not even like on the table, you know, just like how Korea would eat it, like on the floor with a low table and, and having that, you know, uh, kind of conventional yet like very relatable food experience. Like little moments like that, I think really touches me and makes me think like, oh, I know how that feels. Like, oh, I, I know I've been there. Um, and I, I, I think those, to me, I mean, Eric, I think has put in a beautiful story into a certain perspective by, I guess, me as an art director. I really enjoyed those points to break, um, oh, this period was the love and youth and this period is, you know, um, different kind of growth and, um, Cause you know, like as in, as a, when I'm breaking down into colors and all that, it's really helpful for me to know those moments and what to express in that shot. So, so yeah, I, I found them very endearing and relatable. I, I love those moments, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, you know, what Namu sort of achieves in many ways is, is there are moments that are very bold, but there are moments right. that are very subtle. But what I feel like is so consistent is a sincerity of emotion, even in the quiet moments or the big moments, you, you never stop feeling um, for this character and what this character is going through. And again, it's like, it's like a life shrunk down into like such a short period of time and represented purely visually. Um, you, Eric, you talked about, and, and, also, you touched upon this too, like the animation, art, you know, both of you guys are artists. Um, Quill is a program that you guys are going to have to share with our audience, talk through a little bit. I don't know if Maureen, you, you know, you want to talk about that a little bit, but I would love to understand what Quill is and why do the short in Quill. And then I want to talk about some of the painstaking qualities of art making <laughs> Um, that in many ways relate towards a life lived, towards like the painstaking quality of living all these moments of life. But um, let's start with Quill. Like what, what is Quill? And um, why did you guys decide to make Namu and Quill? What is Quill? Yes, um, Quill is a software, VR software developed by Oculus, or is it Meta now? <laughs> so Meta developed this amazing, actually, um, VR software that uh, enables artists to get into the VR headset right away, VR virtual space, and paint and draw and animate intuitively without um, being restrained by any technical limitations or, or restrictions. Because when it comes to VR, it's such a high-end technology, we are scared. Oh my God, we have to learn this and that and whole different medium, whole different way to actually tell the story, which is true. But to me, as a first timer, because I've never done VR before, but um, as a first time who is breaking into the VR, you know, um, technology, Quill was really the the almost like a welcoming door for me. You know, oh my God, Quill, you know, really, it's pretty opposite from how I thought about VR. It really it frees me from all these creative restrictions. You know, and then, and then you know, for example, when it comes to computer generated pipeline, you you don't need to do modeling, you don't need to do rigging, no uh, moving around spotlight to control the lighting. You know. So you just paint and draw and, and you grab your own painting and move around. That's really the concept of Quill, right? Wait, so, wait, Eric. Yeah. So yeah. what you're talking about <laughs> is, is that you put on this VR headset yeah. and you're able to paint in space, mm. in 3D, paint stroke by paint stroke. You said there's no model, there's no rig, but, but what you're talking about is that you're placing a paint stroke in space. Yes. And you're, you're able to three-dimensionally move around that <laughs> and paint and paint and paint is that 
And that's so, how you guys made Namu, is by entirely. painting paint stroke by paint stroke, piece by piece, every character, every object. I mean, the tree, the tree itself is like full of objects that hang in it and it's lit and it's moving. And you're talking about you one by one, paint, <laughs> paint stroke by paint stroke in space. Is that right? Is that right? That sounds yes, very that much. Sounds, <laughs> that sounds crazier than Dam Keeper, which was like a hand painted <laughs> short. And at the time we thought was insane, but this sounds like the next level. It really challenges you from you know, to use all the creative brain muscles you've been working hard on. For example, it is happening in three dimensional space. So you've got to know things, you know, in, in three dimensional space. But um, you've got to be a great painter because nothing does, no computer is generated. It, it, even the lighting, the shadow, the, every single paint stroke is, is you know, um, just, just what, what you see. Um, I don't know, like as, as an art director, awesome. How do you, how, how do you experience, you know, like maybe. You know, you know when I'm ex explaining it to another person who has nothing, who has any right. idea what VR is or Quill, I think the easiest way to explain it is like uh it's a virtual like stop motion it's a lot like that like animating wise or painting right, wise. right 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 uh, but without actual structure underneath those beautifully painted things so <laughs> i think i think it, even like animation too like a lot of the a lot of new angles like if it's not painted on this side you have to paint it again but you still get to like move arms and uh move legs kind of like you have a toy in this floating in this virtual space um, but, you know, another thing too, like there isn't, I think our um, brilliant quill artists, only two of them, like they, uh, yeah, Dan and Nick, they built the every, every set brush, like with the every single brush strokes. And those tools are still very intuitive, yet I think there's a lot of limitations that they actually mimicked textures and certain type of gradations by just eyeing it. And doing it using with just simple, simple brush strokes, um, which is incredible to me. Um, and it was quite magical to just collaborate with them to begin with. Wow. And yeah, and you know how it's like when things are kind of, when things are right, like you don't notice it like cause everything is working together nicely. But with Quill, everything is so somewhat imperfect because everything is made by hand and moved by hand. There's no twinning, there's no rigging. So if, you know, if someone's watching this, watching the film after listening to this, I hope that you guys also appreciate like tremendous amount of effort that went into things that may seem simple, but um, because it has to be leaving the VR quill space, it took another step of like manual work, which I think is crazy. <laughs> Even <laughs> now I'm thinking about it now, it's still crazy to me. <laughs> so simple question, but why, why do it in quill? So basically, there are many reasons why, but the biggest reason is exactly what we've been talking about, the fact that we can hand paint everything, because this is such a warm film, you know, it's really about celebration of life, you know, you know, um, just like how we, you know, decide on the look and style in the Dan Keeper previously, the same core idea was applied to, uh, um, you know, this project as well. And then uh, as soon as I first-handedly experienced Quill, what I realized, even though it sounds very complicated, it is actually not. So what it does to you, it, it saves lots of budget and manpower, actually. So if we are, you know, again, as Asong or Maureen, you know, touched upon a couple of times, we only had even less than five, six Quill artists who, who you know, were able to manage to, you know, uh, um, finish this 12-minute length, you know, of the film. But if we were making this in a traditional computer pipeline, oh my God, I think we'll probably need at least 30, 40 artists from, for, for this complexity and then much more bigger budget and schedule. So that you know, efficiency was also one of, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to do. But at last, again, as I also already touched upon, you know, it just freed me from going over all those technical difficulties. So you know, all those reasons, you know, because of those, I we chose Quill to, yeah, as a main software for this. That's amazing. I mean, I, I think that there is, I mean, it's unlike anything I've really seen before because there's a quality of it that lives in a way that I don't feel like you've experienced before, which is sort of these paint strokes living in space. 
there is a quality, I, I think like there is a quality of light in it and color in it that makes you feel like things are tactile, are really there sitting in space. Um, but there is this kind of lively quality to it. There's this sort of element of craft and movement and, and, and the touch of, of, of an artist um, that lives in every frame and every little element of it. Um, and I also think it's, it's great because the short itself, because you know, there is an element of the growth of this tree. There is, there, things change constantly. Um, light changes, the character changes, the tree changes. Um, it's really amazing. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but it's also, I think like Alsang, you said it, so I'm gonna say it sounds crazy. Um, I'm so glad you guys did it um, because I, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, I think it's all for the audience enjoyment. Um, it's all for the audience's sort of uh, ability to be able to experience all of it. Um, also, can we talk a little bit about lighting and color um, throughout the film? Because, you know, I, I think, you know, at Tonko House, we, we you know, art direction is sort of our specialty and, and area. And uh, using lighting and color and seasons to tell the story is such a huge part of Namu. Um, can you just talk to our audience a little bit about that, what that is? Talk to them a little bit about the color in the film? Um, and yeah, um, I could. I think um, I could mainly break it down into like the two different things you mentioned, like color and the season. And because it is a film that's about one man's life from beginning to the end, um, not only will have like snow, like weathers in general, but the first thing that first direction that we came down to was like driving all the color scheme, color scheme of the entire film, starting from spring to the winter. So it has like a chronological sense to like how the person grows just as the tree grows. And that parallel of the meta visual metaphors made a lot of sense. And, and the second part I think that I took in a lot was actually the Eric's very initial inspiration drawings that was in watercolor. And that watercolor quality of like, you know, somewhat a lot of like negative space and um, space to breathe the, uh, bleed out the color and starting from very soft and pastel tone, like very, uh, like light, a lot of water, like in the color. And then as the person grows and shape up the personality, we brought in more definitions into colors and weathers and the sense of time. Um, I think just following that progression was definitely a biggest thing because it is a film about life and about time. Um, and I think, uh, I think you briefly mentioned that too, like, because it is made out of quill. I mean, the technological part cannot be disregarded, like because it is made out of something that's very tactile and like by hand, I think the whole poetic aspect of it played a lot when it comes to rendering it or picking the colors. Um, and that part, on that part, I have to thank our quill artists to like executing it to another level. Um, but that was, yeah, I think that those two things really got rooted in the beginning and we agreed on it like right away and then was able to make progress quite quickly like in 2D form. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there, there are, you know, I, I think like a lot of films um, that I really enjoy on the surface, you can watch it and just sort of enjoy everything that's happening. You can see the seasons change, you see the lighting change, you can see this little boy grow up into a man and, and, and you know, all throughout his life. And all of it sort of happens, all the transitions happen so seamlessly. And, you know, there is an element of quill because I think when you first see it, you're just like, oh gosh, what is, I've never seen anything like this. And you, you're sort of thinking about it for a second, but the minute you start to get into the story, you're sort of just drawn into this whole thing. And I, I think what I really love about it is that, you know, in prepping for all of this and taking a look at the short again, and is that in every element that I look at, there's such great care and detail, to, attention to detail that I feel like in first viewing, you kind of gloss over it because it's just, there's, there's, it's constantly moving. Mm. Um, and uh, and I, I think like when it's one of those shorts that I just find myself coming back to because it also isn't that loud sort of short. It's one of those shorts that really does live and breathe and have, have its own space. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, it's deceptively in, in many ways, it's so easy to enjoy, but I think the more you dig in, there's greater and greater rewards. And I think that has, says a lot about, you know, the team, it says a lot about what you guys did. It, it makes sense that there was sort of the scale team that was there overall. 
Um, but it also, I, I, I wonder a little bit, Eric, about the story. Um, you know, you and I, we've written stuff together. We've worked on things together. Um, and I know that uh, as just like for everybody, it's a process, like where things start and where things end up um, often uh, aren't such clear paths, right? It's not <laughs> as much as all of us want it to be a straight path. It's often not. And I'm just curious for you, if you can highlight some of the things that from where the project started to the final, what are some big moments or evolutions that you saw in, in either the story, the project, um, your own mindset um, as, as you were working on NAMI? Yeah, um, probably the big, so there are things that never changed, you know, and it's something we all work really hard to maintain and keep, not to lose. And there are things we had to discover and experiment a lot to fill things more in. Because, you know, as I said, you know, I literally, my initial pitch to even Awesome or to Marine or the Baobab team was that doodle I told you guys, you know, like that doodles and some of the watercolor paintings. And it wasn't necessarily a film format. It was just a concept, you know? So, and then, then we started from what, you know, who is this person? You know, like, you know, of course it, it is, has to be universal. But can we make a little more, you know, um, specific characteristic to, to this character? So that's so that because the more specific, more personal, more universal, as we all know. So all those feeling and, and even the life, different life stages too. So, you know, of course, it, it's almost a like poetry, you know, from the youth to the, you know, meeting your love of your life and then the hitting the rock bottom. And there's moments you feel like everything's falling apart, then you recover. And, 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 and then there's, you feel like you're recovering, but, you know, in a certain stage, you realize, oh, I never recovered. You know, what, what myself was still there. I got aged, but it's still there. And then we recover again from that recovery. And then finally, we, we you know, uh, um, land this uh, place where we find the balance. Okay, at the end of the day, we are here. So all those detail, uh, um, you know, uh, um, decision and choice making of, what part of life that should be designed or if, even like, you know, explored was combination of me digging deeper into myself and also open conversation with the teams. You know, it was very conversational actually. Does it, does it make sense? Or am I missing out something? Because again, even though I'm bringing, you know, telling I'm about to share something very personal, but still it has to be, um, that can be, uh, that can resonate with me, every, everybody, hopefully, you know, who watched this. So the main thing, for example, some of the key artworks, surprisingly the same, you know, of some of the one key moments and, you know, from my old, old painting from 10 years ago and one of the screen capture, oh my God, it's still there. Those several, are, you know, moments are there, but all the rest of details that things are added afterwards. So again, I can't really tell you that it is still the same piece, but whole new evolution from a couple of drawings to 12 minute very uh, a rich film, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, thanks Eric for sharing. I mean, you know, I think all of these aspects that we talk about from animation, actually animation is something we haven't talked about. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, your, <laughs> your trade, you know, how you and I met was as an animator, um, yeah. obviously a filmmaker at heart. Everyone on this call is a filmmaker at heart. And, um, but, how is animation on this project different than than other projects? And and how many first, how many animators were there on the project? Uh, two point five, because you two know, and a half, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half animators, but three for the entire uh, for the entire short, entire short. Uh, yeah, three, literally. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. again, there. Were, I can I can name them out. You know, we have Dan. Uh, um, you know, Frankie from Germany, and we have Nick Ladd from Canada. And then, and then um, those two were really the one who painted and designed everything, all the stuff you saw. And then Nick ended up animating all the object animations because, you know, if you get to watch this film, object come to life and tree grows by itself. So those are done by Nick Ladd. And all the character animation is done by one person named John Brower, who's located in Connecticut in the East Coast. So he literally did all the character animation and thankfully Javier Moya from Pixar and myself were really giving him the specific guidance to hit certain quality and in the direction. 
Um, but it was really fun because as I as we briefly touched upon, the way of animating is really different from any other medium I used for so far. It is different from what I did at Pixar. It's not using, you're not using your mouse. You're not using, moving around the, the controllers or AVAR sets. And then, and then, but you're not still also drawing every single thing, but you are grabbing what you painted and move around three-dimensionally. So mm. it's a crazy mix of 3D animation, to do traditional 2D animation, puppeteer stop motion in virtual reality. Um, so yeah, that's how he, I'm not sure if, if my, I'm, if I'm making myself sense, you know, I mean, a lot of, it, you know? a lot of people work in the computer yeah. because the computer does some of the hard work, mm -hmm. but what it sounds like is everything was hand done. Nothing, really there's not a whole cool. lot that you get for free by, by animating in Quill. Not at gotta, all. I mean, like Alison said, it's kind of like stop motion. You, you've got to move frame by frame, piece by piece. Mm hmm um, dear goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what uh, we've yeah, talked about I, some of the. Oh yeah, oh. go ahead. Oh no, I, I was thinking uh, you can cut me out later if you want. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I did want to ask, uh, talk a little more about the animation too, because I, I thought this film particularly had a lot of charms that I always love about Eric's film. Because um, mm. you know, even before Dam Keeper, like How to Eat Your Apple, or um, shorter shorts that he made. You know, I think when even when you were at Pixar. Eric's films always had this way to bring life to a abstract like objects or, um, or what's the right way, way to say it? Like whether it's a tree or whether it's apple, there is a very different kind of interpreting things that we already very know very well. And I think it was very similar in this film. And I remember um, he keep asking Eric, like, I want to see more of that. Like, I want to see more oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. like objects yeah. popping up and like, because you know, tree itself is the character, and you know the 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 metaphor was very tight between the character and the object. And whether you are in v, watching it in VR or watching in two D, there's such a nice way of coming this objects coming alive and morphing around as the person is also growing. I think that was like very trademark thing of like Eric's films, and kind of like always like a director's touch kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, I know who this is as soon as I see it. Um, and you know that which worked beautifully with sound design and music. Um, so I just wanted to spotlight that a little. And what I yeah. love about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think like what's interesting about, you know, I do want to talk a little bit, Eric. Like last year, Opera was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, I do feel like Namu had. I don't want to curse any. I don't want to put anything out in the world. But I, I, I just, I do think this film has an element uh, to it that is different than any of the other films that you've made. As much as I think each film sort of deepens, you know, the filmmaker that I see that that Eric O style, you know, also you're touching upon it. There's like a, there's this real appeal to um, not just how you design Eric, but actually your actual animation is sort of very uniquely you. And um, Namu is one of the more, I would say opera is an appropriate title because it feels like a big fine art piece. And Namu, I feel like has those qualities of the fine art world that you're so great at and in that animation, but it's also one of the most commercial pieces that you've done, I think. Um, can you talk about that, Eric? Is, is, is that how you see this project in terms of, and when I say commercial, not necessarily commercial to sell, I mean sort of its audience feels broader. It feels like a lot more people can watch this and, and sort of connect to it um, in a way. Uh, I, I think a large part of that too is the fact that there's this character that you're following, um, this yeah, right. one character, whereas opera was this huge world that you were presenting. Um, but how was this project different than anything that you've done before? When you look, I mean, because mm -hmm. you're one of the, youngest people that I know that has had a retrospective of your own films. Um, you've done so much film. And how do you place this in, into all the films? How would you talk about this film in contrast to all the films that you've made? Well, I'm not sure if this directly answers what you are pointing out, but you know, some thoughts that came up to me while listening to you is that um, I always, um, find out how to execute certain idea after coming up with the certain ideas. So message and story and idea first, 
and then medium uh, follows after. So that's why if, if any one of you listening to this podcast who are familiar with my art, uh, art or film, you know, may see that, hey, Eric always does something kind of different and <laughs> all the films are kind of like unique to one another. That is because, you know, uh, um, I'm not necessarily finding following the medium but it's all more coming from the more deeper, like a uh, message first, you know? For example, opera, you know, I was very, it's a keen observation of life, you know, in society, history, our civilization, and then, and then all the things don't come in a linear way. Uh, if you look around, everything happens all at once. And that is why, okay, that means, you know, I cannot use this linear type of storytelling that I'm gonna, you know, take it to the physical space so that it is free from the running time so people can watch a couple of times and, and you know and then history cycles too so that itself became the medium already right because the idea already has that that being said in terms of namu um from the get-go yeah it is the journey it is a voyage it is really journey to deep into yourself and that naturally oh my god then we are you know utilizing this vr technology because vr is all about immersive experience and then what I kind of wanted the audience to, um, you know, experience was really that type of quality at the end of the day, I think. So um, the look or style or narrative, the visual, everything just came, started from that initial spark, in my opinion. And then the reason why you feel like, oh, it's, yeah, I, I totally hear you. It's commercial, not a, like all commercial. It's more of being friendly, probably, right? Yeah, I think commercial is the wrong word, yeah. right? It's not Leading. like commercial so much as it is. Yeah, more like um, a, more, more relatable more, in a way. Yeah, relatable and more mm -hmm. communicating, like every single step of your way, right? You know, I needed that, you know, while opera is more like, okay, here we go. You find your where, you find your, you know, answer. It's it's It doesn't matter where you look. It's all about that. While Namu was, every single stage, every single moment, you know, I need you to feel, you want to, I want you to follow the, this man's journey, right? So that definitely, uh, um, you know, um, let me think about using more of traditional uh, linear narrative, I guess, you know? So yeah, not sure. Again, like it's, it's a little more abstract, but that's how I, yeah, that's my outlook on, on how I, when it, when it comes to making film. Yeah. Got it. Um... Here's a kind of an interesting, when we talk about abstract versus clarity, I think one question I have for all three of you and, uh, is, uh, you know, this is about a tree of life. And, and in this, there, there's like many things. There, there are many stages of life. There are moments of love and life and excitement. There are moments of monotony, um, kind of low points. And, you know, for, for all that sort of going on, with you guys, what would be your tree of life? I know this is an abstract question, but how would you sort of think about or talk about your your tree of life? Um, maybe Maureen, do you wanna start? Food, lots of delicious food, like <laughs> that we see, you know, uh, <laughs> kidding, <laughs> kind of. Um, gosh, well, it co totally changes when you have kids. <laughs> It's all about, it becomes all about your family and it's not about you anymore. You can't be self-centered anymore because it's about sustaining this other life and giving them everything. But uh, I would probably say animation is the thing that I have loved my entire life and have chased my entire life. It's why I designed the major I did, even when I took the circuitous, circuitous route through like business and UI design to product management and games is all because at the the thing I always loved throughout the entire thing was animation. And that's why I was so excited when I met you. And I wanted to be your friend forever afterwards, even though I wasn't in animation. I'm like, one day and doing the side projects at night, the dam keeper, right? Side project, Total Frost project, side project, sketch travel, side project. I was like, whatever I could do to be part of that world. Um, and then finally now doing it. Um, so I think it would be filled with animation and, and art. And what I'm doing now is so that I could be around talented artists like you. So that would be in my personal tree in terms of what has mattered to me in life. And then a big life change, of course, would be having kids. And it's probably just filled with lots of breast milk now would be <laughs> my tree of life because my entire life revolves around 
being a cow and producing milk. Um, but yes, <laughs> than that, it would be animation. That's amazing, Maureen. That's amazing and, and really inspiring to hear. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Eric, also, do you guys want to take a crack? Uh, I'll go next. Um, yeah, uh, let me see. It's, it's really hard. That's a really hard question. Um, I think just, I, th I, I suppose um, for the, as, as of this moment, um, my tree just has been transplanted from LA to San Francisco. Um, try to get used to the weather, you know, mm -hmm. not quite knowing like where to root down or uh, where to branch out really. Just kind of filling out the air, I suppose. Um, and as far as like the objects that could define or things that might be up on the tree, it that's tough. Because um, right now I'm kind of vagabonding, like I'm in a sublet, I don't really have much right now. <laughs> but it really is, yeah, like so much of it is like for me animation too. And also try to figure out like what I like to make more, you know? I think I think this collaborating with Eric um, in the last couple of years on Namu too, but with other projects, and I've been a, I've I've had chance to collaborate with many different companies, and I think that gave me kind of more courage to branch out and really know what I should focus on. I think, and also coming up, not I can't say coming out, but um, after like a year or two of a COVID time too, which where my tree has been just kind of hiding in the indoor, not being able to get sunlight. <laughs> and now it's like, where is the sun? Like, I need to find a way to bloom a little. Uh, yeah. I think I'm there. I think my tree is doing that right now. Just, just reaching out the window and try to get some sun in this new town. That's uh, amazing. <laughs> so also, you're like a potted, you're like a potted tree. You're like uh, sitting yeah. in a pot. Um, yeah, just paper. waiting to be planted. Yeah. Um. And Maureen, I'm surprised you didn't say that, I, that you would just be a baobab tree, given the studio. Is oh, yeah. the same baobab. thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Think about your family the baobab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Animation, um, yeah. Yeah, animation <laughs> baobab, giant yeah. animation baobab. <laughs> um, that's beautiful, Asang. Uh, Eric, uh, your tree of life. I mean, you've kind of yeah. I mean, I kinda, Namu is your tree of life. I mean, one one hope though is, I hope you know. I think we all all are in this room, and then whoever listens to, I mean, because in the film there is a moment where uh, you know certain span of time he almost loses himself. You know, lose he stopped looking at even taking care of all his own tree and all that. You know. I always do my best not to do that. Hopefully, you know, keep you know thinking about. And what's also interesting is because this does cover like entire life story. Like you know, depending on who's watching, you know, they relate to this film in different level. You know, for mm -hmm. example, this is like a fun. I don't know if Zach and Matt are amazing musician composers who also worked on the Dan Keeper, Dan Keeper poems, this Namu, and and um Zach, um kind of like at the time I when I pitched this story he kind of broke up with his girlfriend <laughs> and then he was having a bit of a tough time and when he was looking at it he was related to that in a, in a fun playful way that's me right there you know so mm. something like that was kind of like a fun you know but of course it wasn't fun fun but an um, interesting experience to see how you know people react to this differently depending on where they are right so yeah Eric, where do you think you are in terms of all of that? Where do you see yourself? I mean, you and I have seen some, we've paired up on a lot of yeah. things and collaborated yeah, yeah. a lot. We've seen a lot of the highs and a lot of the lows. Right, 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 right. Where, where are you now, I feel like, in terms of the in, in like, I kind of also relate to what Awesome pointed out, you know? So um, yes, life is filled with so many ups and downs and, and you know, there were some tough times and in, in a personal level. And also, you know, really going through this COVID situation was, you know, we all were there together. You know, we all suffered, you know, um, people were losing their family, you know, um, like their shelter and everything. And then that also I got a huge impact as well. Um, but feeling like, you know, I don't know, right now, there are definitely days I feel like, ah, oh, things are not, you know, going as I want and things are not really helping me out. Um, but I feel, 
you know, I love to, I don't know, take this momentum to incline. I don't know, you know, so I am definitely at a stage where I'm starting to take care of my own tree a little more in the deeper level, but, you know, not, not to spoil the movie, not because in the movie, he kind of almost sort of ditches, you know, tree a little bit, but I'm, I'm feeling like in the crossroads, but choosing different path to take more deeper care of my tree so that, you know, it could hopefully grow in a, in a, I don't know, more healthier and more positive direction. So I think that's where I'm at, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that's beautiful. I mean, I think you guys, you know, you guys, it's interesting to hear like, you know, Maureen, you talked about um, literal birth and inspiration, finding it in animation. And, you know, also you talked about sort of being moved, like moving and uprooting and, and reaching for the window, reaching for the light and trying to figure out you know, kind of your place. And I, it feels like, Eric, you, you're sort of in that same place too of, of just, you know, yeah, there's been a lot, you're, you, you know, your tree has grown and you've, got, you've gotten to a place, but, but that you're also seeking out, you know, that hopeful thing, that, that next thing. Um, and I really am excited about it. I, I'm excited for more people to see Namu. Um, I do think it's, it's, it's a film, it's one of those films that I found myself return to and watch more, you know, more, more times than I'd like to admit to, to you, Eric, um, and this team, but, uh, but I've watched it uh, quite a few times and I think it's a really beautiful film. Um, Maureen, real quick, as we kind of are wrapping things up, where can people watch Namu? Yeah, before I say that, can I say one last thing about <laughs> Chiyuble, your last question? One thing that um, really inspired me from Namu is I'm not generally a super happy person because I'm always thinking of what needs to be better. Right and and always thinking what's wrong. What I can achieve more. What can I do better? And what really inspired me about his um, this film and his vision is about no matter what through like the goods and the bads, it, your life is still beautiful. No matter what is it at the end, it's a perfect round circle. Spoilers, but it's a perfect round circle, and it, none of that, none of it matters. It's 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 beautiful no matter what and. It just gave me perspective, especially right now during COVID, when a lot of people are losing people or evaluating what matters to them and is meaningful in their lives. I think this um, this project will actually make people think about that, and I hopefully they look they reflect and are happy with whatever it is, all the good and all the bad. Um, but anyways, uh, outside of oh, that, that's amazing. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's in, amazing. In yeah. Of, you. where you can see right now. So one of the places is Animation Showcase, Benoit's uh, platform. We're super honored that he chose a, a Namu to be one out of seven that he said were the best of 2021. That's amazing. Um, we're also doing a, a virtual screening with the CIFA. Um, so if you're a CIFA member, we're doing a virtual screening on this December 7th at 5 p.m. Pacific. So just sign up for that. Um, and then we have different plans in the works to hopefully share it with like bro more broadly um, in the future. But just come of our people, If people want to follow you guys, social media, Baobab is yes. the best place to kind of hear about screenings and uh, appearances and, and all of that stuff. Um, well, you guys, first and foremost, thank you for the film. I think it's, it really is a gift. And I, I know it was a long time in the works. And uh, I think Maureen, that's the perfect way to end it. I think there's a timeliness to Namu that I think, you know, I think part of the reason why I've watched it so much is because it is hopeful. Um, and so thank you guys for the film, but also thanks for coming onto the podcast um, and joining us here and sharing your story uh, for everyone, uh, with everyone. Um, thank you guys so much. We will all talk soon in real life. Thank I you, hope. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, guys. <laughs>